Truth, and I am Pastor Falls from the Gateway Abiding Word Ministries here in the Gambia. This is our penultimate, hopefully penultimate, part in our six-part series in which we have been discussing leadership qualifications and leadership considerations. And I want to thank you all for the different feedback we are receiving, and we just want to add value to what we believe will make our country once and for all, turn towards an upward, positive, prosperous, progressive, and advanced society. We have what it takes. But as somebody once said, everything falls and rises on leadership. And that's true. And because we are just a few, two weeks literally, away from presidential elections, it's important for us to be aware to be informed so that we take time and be very pensive on how we vote, why we vote, what we vote for, and definitely who we vote for. Because that is going to decide by and large what will happen to us in the next five years from now to 2026 December. Whatever we vote for, whoever we vote for, why we vote, and how we vote would be the determining factor for what happens to us. And so we want to ask ourselves, we talk a lot about system change, we look, talk a lot about change, progress, advancement. When it comes to moving forward as a nation and as a people, you normally have two options, unfortunately. And because we are a democracy, not a theocracy, we have two options in voting. We either vote for a continuation of the status quo that is in any situation, or we vote for an embellishment, a transformation, and an outright change. It all depends on how we view and weigh and balance what has happened to us, what is happening to us, and what we choose to prioritize on. But the balancing and the prioritization come from our sense of purpose. What do I want as a Gambian? Where do I think I should be five years from now? I will be in my 60s, you know, almost mid-60s by then. What do I want to be seen? And you may be older than me, you may be in my age bracket, or much younger than me. What do you want to see? What is it that will make us remain in our country, love our country, and see what other countries have commensurate to our size and how we galvanize ourselves as a people to prosper our nation together and stay here and stem the tide of backway and all the things that seem to be us from political problems to religious problems to legal law and other problems and to corruption, hemorrhaging problems. The answer will be in that marble that you and I hold and cast on the 4th of December, Saturday. It will be our vote, our power, our franchise, our voice, our hopes, our expectations, our dreams, our inspirations for the next five years. And whether we vote or not, the next five years will come. The world will move. Whatever is happening will happen. I am almost sure that in the next five years, space tourism and all the things that they're working on will be normal. Will we still be fighting religious bigotry? Will we still be fighting filth on the streets? Will we still be fighting law and order, lack of power, internet problems, water problems, tribal problems? Or would we have sidestepped that and had a focus and a sense of direction and benchmark targets that would lead us to what we desire? Because it's not what we hope necessarily for. It's what we work hard on. We pride ourselves when we talk about Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, Rwanda. We sing the Rwandan story. But it was not God that came from heaven and walked it out. The inspiration obviously comes from him. But there were people who knew that Gambia was bigger than a person. Gambia was bigger than a party. Gambia was bigger than tribal sentiments. And Gambia was and is definitely bigger than religious sentiments. And Gambia must be a country for its size that abhors, eschews, 
corruption and lawlessness. And so as we approach the next two weeks, for you and I who understand what I'm saying and for those who make it their duty joyfully to explain to those who do not understand what their power is, that that marble is bigger than a bag of rice, is bigger than buying votes, is bigger than dancing daga, is bigger than eating benching, is bigger than, bigger than anything. In fact, no marabu has power over your marble. You can cast it by your conscience and speak your mind on that day. And so what are some of the considerations? We've already established that all of us cannot be in leadership together. So leadership, we said, is representation, is responsibility, is sacred trust, is followership, is humility, and it's servanthood. We said that. And then we built on a few things. And because we have at least two more segments, I want to proceed a bit faster. We said a leader cannot lead if they don't have self-government. If in your own self, you cannot delineate between state funds and personal funds and family things and state things that once you come into power, you feel it's for your family. And suddenly what was non-existent or what was very small in humble measures some, somehow just becomes a larger than life manifestation, which to all intents and purposes is corrupt, is theft of state funds. Then we who vote, need to ask ourselves these questions. And those who want to come in power, we need to ask those questions too. And that's why things like assets declaration are important. There must be self-government, a leader that cannot say no to their appetites, to their desires, to their friends. It's not worth a leader. It's just somebody who maybe sits on a chair like I'm doing, seems to have power, but has no authority, has no influence, is remote controlled. You know, when we were young, we had this puppet that we played, they call it Sally One Side. A puppet, you, you pull a string and the hand goes up, you pull a string and the hand goes up. It's like there's a puppet master or mistress or masters and mistresses at the back who are pulling the strings. And they could be people with power, with money, they could be spiritual forces that we feel helpless to. And that happens more often than not when you have sold your soul, sold your conscience, sold your willpower, and you are ready to mortgage the entire nation for your wants. We've seen that happen in other nations. We've seen it happen in our nation. And it never works. It will never work. At best, it stunts the growth of a nation. But we catch up. So a leader must be self-governing. A leader must have self-control. A leader must have self-awareness, self a sound mind, mental stability, integrity, word of honor. We talked about that last time until I talked about uh, 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 somebody in power that we had some time ago whose brother was involved in some currency uh, misappropriation and he tendered his resignation. That was integrity. A leader must have moral excellence. We woke up one year in the late 90s and saw that a very big leader had got into very, very incredible, unbelievably stupid immoral activity with a lady almost the age of his daughter. And the world was feeding us with a blue dress stained with a president's semen. That is not leadership. That person has to be able to organize himself. Ladies and gentlemen, if you put a million dollars on a table for somebody who wants to be a leader and 10 days later you come and there is 999,999 that person doesn't qualify to be a leader a leader you say well but pastor forbes you only took one dollar one dollar becomes ten it's the ability to beat that temptation beat that appetite and say no but if you leave a million dollars and you come six months later and it's a million dollars that's a leader, not somebody who tells you a story that we passed it this way. I passed it through my husband's account. I passed it through my wife's account. I took it from my son. No, no, no. So there must be moral excellence. There must be the fear of God. And the fear of God is not just talk. A lot of people talk. We swear over the Bible, swear over the Quran. We say uh, by God's power, we say inshallah. And as we are literally spewing those terms, there is evil intent, corruption, unbelievable collateral madness that comes out 
of the level of corruption. And we almost do it like in a mindless way. What in Wolof we say, Mate. In Creole we say, Nami Duam. I can literally say it the way they say it. You know, it's like, Dara Duchigena. You don't need such a leader because any leader that is that heartless and mindless, as we look around and plan to vote, you need to avoid such a leader. A leader must be accountable. A leader who hides their properties or cannot be able to tell you how they got properties. Ladies and gentlemen, that's bad news. A leader must understand the principles of delegation. A leader who wants to do everything will get into trouble. So if we vote for a president who wants to be the president and the chief justice and the legislative arm and the press and wants to lecture everybody, you're going to have an issue. If you also want to vote for a president who is totally aloof and just delegates in the sense of abdicating, you have a big problem. We'll have a big problem because the box stops at the table of the leader. Many, many years ago, I learned that even though as a person, I do not necessarily handle the finances in Abiding World Ministries, but I know, I ask, I have to know, I have to be informed because I learned that you are always the chief accounting officer. You must know. You must know. You just don't leave it to the CFO. You just don't say, you go ahead. You must find out. And occasionally, you bring a shock into the system so the system knows that you know. So the leader must be able to delegate but not abdicate. The leader must be able to work with a team and not go solo. A leader must be able to take counsel and advice. I've always laughed when I say this, that people see us do great programs in Abiding Word Ministries. Yes, yes, I am the leader and I'm not just a figurehead. I know what is doing. I chart the vision. I understand what is happening. But you surround yourself with people who are even smarter than you. People who can interpret the vision, you know, who can interpret the manifesto, who are going to make sure you stay on the straight and the narrow so that come four years time, you are not begging people with bags of rice. You are not begging them with drums of oil. You are not telling them long stories and dropping electric poles as is done very copiously over in Africa and sometimes in our own country. You are saying that look at the work, look at the work and you are not piggybacking on what somebody else does which is not bad, that's good. Because in the dynamics of continuity, if government A started something and they could not finish it and they were outvoted, government C, B should see the good of what government A did and continue. Like one American presidential candidate said, it, you'll be surprised how far we can go when nobody cares who gets the glory. Nobody cares who gets the glory. Because ladies and gentlemen, take for example, Maybe you are standing as I'm speaking under, you are watching this program under a tree. You know, you've packed your car under a tree just to watch this program and you are enjoying the shade. But you know, you did not plant that tree. You didn't plant the tree. Somebody planted that tree, either inadvertently, maybe somebody unfortunately uh, licked some orange and spewed the seeds and threw them on the ground, which of course is not right. But a tree sprouted. Years later, that tree provides shade for you. You didn't plant that tree, but you benefit. Now, if everybody wants to say, I want to do it zero to 100, nothing will happen because life is like a relay. You run the 100 meters and you give somebody else and they run, but when you win, the team has won. So governments not must not want to reinvent the wheel to make their point. You know, you cancel everything, you pull down everything, you change every name. We, we see that in Africa all the time. You know, somebody named the street James, and then when you come, you change it to Isatu, and when you lose power, they change it to Margaret, and when you lose power, they change it to Mustafa. Uh, that's, it's going around in circles. So a leader is someone who is able to delegate. As we check, as we vet, as we listen to debates, as we watch rallies, as we go down history, is this person able to delegate or will they want their hands in every pie? Do they have a sense of patriotism and nationalism? Do they understand geopolitics, global awareness, or are they just fixated on something? Because you know, sometimes you can be so fixated on something that when it's over, you really didn't have a plan. So if I want to stand as a president of the Gambia and maybe my plan is to punish the government in power or to do something and it so happens that I win. 
I either take my five years punishing or maybe two years and after that I'm lost. I have another three years and I scratch my head. What was I supposed to do? It is what happens when we saw that in the Second Republic and we've seen that in this. For the longest time between 1994 all the way to the mid-2000s, we kept on hearing 30 years of Jawara, 30 years of Jawara, 30 years of Jawara. Now we hear 22 years of Jawara, I mean, 22 years of the dictator, 22, okay, put that aside. What are you going to do about it? What can you do? Are you able to hit the road running? Or are you going to scramble to put together a team? Geopolitics is key. Global awareness is key. There's so many things going on around the world. Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, Israel. So many things. Western Sahara. What are your thoughts? Even Kazaman's next door. What are your thoughts? Nigeria, Boko Haram, Tanzania, Tigray, Ethiopia. What are your understandings? Cryptocurrency. Where do you stand? Because if you are not globally aware, and you say, well, I'll lean on my foreign minister for the foreign policy, you'll get into trouble. So if you don't know and don't have a panoramic, holistic view of leadership, how are you going to do it? It's not just knowing the regions of the Gambia. The Gambia is 2.3 million people. The world, ladies and gentlemen, is 8 billion people. So how exposed, how well read, what is your worldview so that maybe you can leave a legacy? There is a scripture I want to use. The Bible puts like that. It says the horse is prepared for war, but it's the Lord that gives victory. And so there must be some understanding of the fear of God in you. I will question any leader in power or trying to come into power who has two very flashlight telling signs. One, a leader who is imperv impervious to public opinion, doesn't listen to the voice of the electorate, doesn't listen to what the people are saying. You are impervious. It's almost like Nanyuwa, Bunsona, the Nanyopi. Made them talk when they're tired, they will set much. Much like how a parent will treat a ch child. Cry, cry blood. We used to be told as kids, try, cry blood. When you are quiet, when you are tired, you will stop. No. In leadership, because it's representative, because it's responsibility, because I'm giving you my sacred trust, you must listen. So if I complain, I am not opposition. If I complain, I am not tribalistic. If I complain, I'm not a religious fanatic. I just love my country. I want things to work right for my country, which I believe is why you said you want to be at the helm. But if you're impervious, you are deaf, totally inconsiderate, to where the nation is. The nation is crying, the nation is bleeding, and you don't listen. How would you want to lead? So everybody, the six candidates, and the contraptions that have happened from the 26th to where we have them now, are you already impervious to public opinion? Are you operating on an ostrich syndrome that you bury your head in the sand and it's like you live in a make-believe world, which is super huge ego, thinking that you are good all by yourself. A leader that is impervious to public opinion. And let me add, even to legal matters, to court orders. It's not fit to do this job. Because I may be watching somewhere from, who knows, Hong Kong. And I'll be saying, well, I have... Seven million dollars that I want to invest in this country. But it looks like this country doesn't obey court orders. This country bullies. This government is a tyrant government. This person that wants to come into power seems to be like that. The other thing about it is that any person who is in leadership or plans to be in leadership, but who is very, let me use the word fluid, somebody who changes very quickly, 
Today they are black, tomorrow they are white. Wednesday they are green, Thursday they are black again. In fact, there is a verse in the Bible that goes like this. Do not meddle with people who are given to sudden change. Because there is no consistency. In some ways, there is no loyalty. I mean, the people are flipping. All you see is opportunism. All you see is an opportunistic spirit. And you cannot walk with that. So, for example, if I want to be president and I'm giving $4,000 to everybody, people will rush to me until they hear that the person across the road is giving $12,000. And they will literally jump across the road. Now, that's probably understood, unfortunately, for the electorate. But in leadership, a leader that's given to sudden change is just flipping, flipping, flipping under the guise that politics has no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, but only permanent interests. No, some of these phrases are overstretched. If you understand that leadership is sacred trust, it's responsibility, you're dealing with families and lives and generations and hopes and aspirations and dreams and expectations, then you cannot just be flipping anyhow you like and quoting phrases and saying so many things. After all, we can all say what we like. What you need to do is switch sides and ask yourself how you will feel if people were saying to you and the prospects of your livelihood and your family generationally what you are saying even as you won the office or even as you are in the office. What kind of a leader? And to us, the electorate, these are the considerations that we must ask ourselves. Because a leader in waiting, a leader on a chair that is impervious to public opinion, the people are crying and people are saying it as well. Sometimes you listen to radio programs and you wonder, are we living in the same country? People are suffering and people are saying, but it's better, it's good. No, that's political prostitution. That is blindsiding everything. That's really becoming bad. And ladies and gentlemen, those are the early warning signs of the beginning of, beginning of tyranny, dictatorial and autocratic tendencies. And those need to be stopped by our vote. It's not a person thing. It's not a personal thing. We all keep saying that Gambia is bigger. Every forum that you have attended or you have seen on TV, they are training the press, they are training the uh, security people, they are training everybody. At the end of the day, people are making statements that let's vote and let's deal with the outcome of the vote and know that Gambia stands. Well, that Gambia that stands is an entity that's bigger than each one of us that should give us the liberty and the freedom to speak truth without fearing, without having ill will or affection or feeling that somebody's ox is going to be God, even if they're from our family, even if they are friends, even if they are relatives, even if they're from our tribe, and definitely even if they are religious compatriots. So any leader that has a tendency to be impervious to what the people is feel, are feeling, or any leader that is flouting order, and I mean, you, you pledge to uphold the law and the constitution, and you flout it with flying colors, then such leaders are not worth our vote because they only tell you that this is what we are going to do. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I, the electorate, that's why I said we have two options all over the world. You either vote for continuity, which is a thumb sign that keep going, we appreciate you, good or bad, or you vote for change. The issue about change is that we do not know how it will go. The issue about continuity is that if it's been a good trajectory, we are okay. If it's been a bad trajectory, a sign of tyranny, lawlessness, corruption, then our vote becomes an endorsement for that kind of behavior to continue. And guess what? It continues in a more reckless, heartless, mindless way for the next five years. So what are we going to do? A leader must be strong in character. A leader must be fair-minded. You know, a leader can't just, like we say in my language, Creole, one yes, better no, all, all you hear is what they tell you. No, a leader says, okay, yes, I've had all the arguing, but it's like a judge. I've had all the arguments. Everything has been quoted constitutionally by the law. Let me retire to my chambers and let me think. 
for the common good. Let me think. And ladies and gentlemen, my personal desire is that I want a leader that will do that. And sometimes leaders do that even at the expense of their staying in office beyond the term. I've said this because I heard it. I don't have factual evidence to it, but I remember being told that when there seemed to be a little impasse in Nigeria, President Buhari sitting and former President Goodluck Jonathan, and God knows they were trying to doctor the figures or something. They were in a room, you know, and they were telling President Jonathan, we can do this, we can do that. And the story I hear is that he just told them to give him a minute. He walked into another room, picked up the telephone, called General Buhari and called him Mr. President. I think President Momo of Sierra Leone also did something like that. And once that was done, all the fighting, and to quote President Jonathan, I hear he said, I hear President Goodluck Jonathan said that his presidency is not worth the blood of a Nigerian. Because if he continued to fight it, you know, our big brothers in Nigeria are quite active and vociferous and, you know, they charged up. People would have died for no cause. Do you want to preside over dead bodies? Do you want to preside over an ingovernable country because you want to sit on a chair by force because people tell you you must sit on it by force? Is that the legacy we want? No. So sometimes in leadership, when you weigh the options, you say, look, yes, I definitely know that to score political points, I will not build a school in this area because it's opposition. But for all you know, the national demographics show that the children who are doing well in exams are coming from that area. It's a win-win for you, my friend. Build it there. Everybody will know you built it. It's not the opposition that built it. And the opposition too will come one day and if their conscience is right, they will know that this was built here. This was statesmanship. This was leadership. The man is not of our party, but he built a school for our party. We are using it as political points. And guess what? Sometimes that even gives you more votes because you are now thinking nationalistically, holistically, panoramically, and you can do things properly. Those are the kinds of leader, leaders we want. Leaders who can sacrifice. Not leaders who are hungry and thirsty and almost fainting for power. And I know it's been said that it is those who are hungry for power that get it. But, you know, power corrupts. And we have seen it. And so we need to ask. That's why we need to engage both privately, social media, in the debates, in the forums, and listen keenly to all the campaigns and see. Do you hear the voice of unification? Do you hear the rhetoric of a unifier? Do you hear we, we, or me, me, I, I, my party, my party, my people, my people? Those are signs. And I'll end this segment by saying that a leader must be a good political negotiator, an arbiter, a peacemaker, and not an impulsive, hot-tempered, person. As I said, somebody giving to sudden change, moving the goalpost all the time. You cannot plan anything with such a person. Because just when you thought they said five, next week somebody will come and buy a national asset, buy a state enterprise. And you say, what happened? Say, well, it was sold. When was it sold? Oh, when they did a trip to Dubai. So we, the electorate, must understand the power we hold. And I'm going to stop here and hopefully next week I'll do my final segment but let me say that until I come away by the grace of God, I hold no fault for anybody. I will vote my conscience. But ladies and gentlemen, the next five years are in our hands. And the way they go are squarely related to the decision you and I make. And when we've made that decision, excuse the language, they say in English, you will have to shut up and put up because this is what we decided for. I pray that God will help us and guide us and our nation will advance. Until I come your way next week, by the grace of God, this is Pastor Fom saying, let's have a good day and God bless the Gambia.